Good morning. I am always hesitant to interrupt your good conversation because obviously you're discussing things that are of importance and sometimes not so important. My name is Sam Pardew and I have the great privilege of being the Dean and Director of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences here at UGA. I have been here a little over 10 months and have explored much of the great state of Georgia and visited uh, uh, some of you as well. You know, this is the ag forecast and, and we're by implication trying to look into the future. Sometimes that crystal ball's a little hazy and things are not as clear as we'd like for them to be. But I'll give you a personal example. When we started this year's ag forecast in Macon, the future was different. Since that time, we have had devastating storms in South Georgia and the lives of many people in that region have been forever changed. They got up one morning thinking things were gonna be okay and then a very different scenario occurred. I'm reminded of a commercial not long ago that said the most important things in life are not things. And I think the events that occurred in South Georgia certainly reinforces that idea. My dad's 90 years old and he has uh, a couple of sayings that hopefully he has gained some measure of wisdom in that time. And he said that the, the problems in life that can be solved by time and money are really not problems. It is those things that neither time nor money can fix that we have to worry about. And I can tell you that there are people who are rebuilding their lives and rebuilding their homes. Those things that they can certainly do in time. A gentleman talked about the fact that his, his farm had been there for generations and it was his hope that it would continue to be, but they're going to have to rebuild. So we think a lot about the future and we're going to learn some things today from folks that will tell us where we think we're headed at least economically on the ag side of things. But I mentioned before that those of us who are in agriculture are by nature optimistic. You have to be to continue doing those things. So I'm glad that you're here. Uh, I wanna thank the people who have worked hard to put this on and our speakers today. Um, today is the last of the uh, ag forecast tour. There's a certain finality to that and we'll do it again next year, but I'm glad that you're here, we're excited. I do wanna remind you a little bit about the life of the history of the state of Georgia and the University of Georgia. Today is Founders Day. In 1785, this institution was chartered and for the next 232 years, it has made an indelible mark on the state of Georgia. So we're happy that you could join us and some of you may not have recognized that today is truly Founders Day. I'm excited about what the next 232 years will be as it's influenced by the men and women who walk the halls of the University of Georgia and in particular, the College of Ag and Environmental Sciences. Thank you so much for all that you do for this state, for agriculture, for the university and for the college. We're gonna change our program up just a little bit. Um, our next speaker, uh, Brent's gonna come. Uh, he, he's a true academician in that he said, I gotta get back and teach class. So Brent. Well, thank you all for being here today and giving me the opportunity to um, give you some sense of what we're facing this year, not necessarily from an economic perspective, but from a regulatory perspective. So for the next few minutes, what I'll talk about is the veterinary feed directive and what the veterinary feed directive is gonna do to us from the standpoint of livestock production, not just economically, but also what steps we need to take moving forward to make sure we're in compliance with these regulations. So as we go through today, we'll give you a little bit of background. We'll spend time talking about antimicrobial resistance. We'll talk about resistance in human medicine. We'll talk about resistance in animal agriculture. We'll use that to preface talking about FDA guidances 209 and 213. 
what they say and what they mean. Those are the veterinary feed directive as we know it today. From there, we'll go into the implications for livestock production and what we as cattle, swine, poultry producers need to know to make sure that we're in a good place to deal with the regulatory environment as it changes. So when we look at antimicrobial resistance in humans, we know, and, and, and I don't think that you can look at the news, any channel, and not see some report of a multi-drug resistant infection acquired by someone somewhere, whether it's here in North America or in Europe, but across the US, we see about 2 million multi-drug resistant infections every year. And of those 2 million people that develop these infections, about 23,000 will die. So it, it has implications for the health and well-being of humans, certainly. We also know that it puts a tremendous economic burden on the healthcare industry as well. It costs the US about $20 billion every year in direct costs. It costs us another $35 billion every year in indirect costs. And there's absolutely no question that it's driven by and large by the overuse of antimicrobials. And it's been estimated that about 50% of all prescriptions written for antimicrobials for people are unnecessary. So, so there's a disconnect there. Um, and, and although what I talk about today is focused on antimicrobial use in veterinary medicine, there are some associations again with, with how they use them in people and, and don't think that human medicine is not trying to change their patterns too. There, there, there's a push on that side. So it's not just us. Now, when we look at livestock, up until January 1 of this year, we used antimicrobials to promote growth, improve feed efficiency, and also treat and control different diseases, primarily respiratory disease in cattle, swine, and poultry. We know that livestock are responsible on a per kilogram basis for 80% of all the antimicrobials sold in this country. So of all the antimicrobials sold, we use 80% of those. And we know that of all these antimicrobials that we use, 95% are sold for administration in food or water. Most of them go into feed, a smaller proportion in water. And of these medically important drugs, 98% are available over the counter. So there's no you know, oversight of how these compounds are being used like there is in human medicine. So when we look at why we use antimicrobials and we focus on cow-calf production, because that's by and large the beef sector where we use these drugs, the good news is only about 16% of us are actually using antimicrobials for any purpose at all. So you know, when we talk about the VFD and we look at the impact that it's going to have, it's not something that on the cattle side of things is going to be too dramatic. Swine and poultry is a little bit different. But when we look at the use of antimicrobials and we look at pre-weaned calves, we're using it primarily to prevent disease. A smaller proportion of us are using them for some other purpose. We look at replacement heifers that have been weaned. We use them, again, primarily to prevent respiratory disease. And then other calves, primarily feeder calves that haven't been shipped to feedlots yet, we use them, again, primarily to prevent respiratory disease. So, again, the good news that comes out of that is this purpose is still legal and allowed under the VFD with some slight changes. Those of us that are using these drugs to promote growth, which is a, a minority of us, that will be a change, but again, it's not gonna affect most of us by and large. So when we look at antimicrobial resistance and we look at the public perception, the general public doesn't see the use of antibiotics to promote growth as being justifiable. It, it, they, don't, they don't understand that concept. And they see it as the, the use of antimicrobials in livestock, or at least the overuse of antimicrobials in livestock, as driving the increase in the prevalence of resistant bacteria. Again, that's the public perception. So the current concern is that these resistant bacteria that are causing these infections in hospital are being transmitted from animals to people through the food supply. And now we can't treat these infections because of the misuse of drugs in animal agriculture. And so when we look at how that may happen and what the public sees, it's cow, or the chicken, or the pig is fed an antibiotic. And that antibiotic is being used to make them a little bit fatter. And so that antibiotic kills off some bacteria, but it leaves some behind. The ones that it leaves behind are the ones that won't respond to any treatment, no matter what it is. And those bacteria, for whatever reason, contaminates the, the product derived from that animal, the fertilizers we use for crops in some other way gets into the food supply. Well, we as people consume that final product or 
by handling those animals, acquire these bacteria. And with that, we end up in the hospital with an infection that is, again, untreatable. So in 2013, the CDC put out a report called Antimicrobial Resistant Threats in the U.S. And in that report, they ranked resistant bacteria by their threat level, urgent, serious, and concerning. Of the 18 bacteria they ranked in that report, four had a clear origin from the food supply. Of those four, only two had an origin that we could potentially link back to animals, and that was Campylobacter and Salmonella, specifically non-typhoidal Salmonella. So again, when we look at those numbers and we say, well, out of 18, only two can be linked to animals, it's not bad, but again, we have some role in that. When we look at Campylobacter, we see that every year in the U.S., we, we have about 1.3 million infections reported every year. That's just what's reported. There are probably a lot more that, that go unreported. And of those 1.3 million, about 300,000 are classified as drug resistant. We see about 13,000 hospitalization and 120 deaths. When we look at the situation with resistance in Campylobacter, in 1997, only about 12% of Campylobacter strains were resistant to ciprofloxacin, one of the primary drugs used to treat these infections. Fast forward now to 2011, the prevalence of resistance has increased to about 25. So from 1997 to 2011, the prevalence of resistance almost doubled. Well, why do we care? What's the issue with a drug like ciprofloxacin? Well, if we're using Batril in cattle to treat respiratory disease, Batril, when given to a cow, is metabolized to ciprofloxacin in the liver. So by exposing cattle to Batril, we could be exposing Campylobacter to ciprofloxacin, thereby perpetuating resistance. And it's not just cattle, it's poultry too. They metabolize the drug the same way. Now, when we take a look at Salmonella, Salmonella is similar in that we see about 1.2 million infections every year. Of those 1.2 million infections, 100,000 are drug resistant. So a, a lower prevalence of resistance, but it costs us about $400 million every year. One bug, $400 million. When we look a little bit more closely now at the situation with resistance to Salmonella, in 1996, there was no resistance to either ceftriaxone or ciprofloxacin. Again, we fast forward now to 2011. We're at, with both drugs, about 3%, although there have been some peaks up closer to 5 Again, we know the situation with ciprofloxacin and its association with similar drugs in cattle, but what about ceftriaxone? Why does ceftriaxone matter? Well, drugs like Naxel, Xenel, Exceed, drugs if we have cattle, beef, or dairy, swine for that matter too. Ceftiofur, the parent compound in that drug, is essentially animal ceftriaxone. So if it's resistant to ceftiofur, it's also resistant to ceftriaxone. So again, the concern there is by misusing these drugs in animals, we contribute to resistance in these important human pathogens. When we take a look now at resistance in livestock, we know that resistance in manhamia, the bacteria most commonly associated with respiratory disease in feedlot and stalker calves, is an emerging threat. If we look at data from the Kansas State University Diagnostic Lab, and we look here at 2009, there were 35% of the isolates submitted to that diagnostic lab that were resistant to no antimicrobials at all, nothing. But you could treat them, at least in the lab setting, with anything. Again, we come now three years later to 2011, it's flipped. Now 35% are resistant to at least five drugs, if not more. In a three-year period, we saw a complete shift in susceptibility patterns. <clears throat> Work that we've done that's been supported by the Georgia Beef Commission with private stocker operators here in Georgia, looking at the proportion of manhamia that are resistant to different antibiotics before and after metaphylaxis with Drax. The blue bars here represent before treatment, the red bars represent after treatment. This would be Exceed, here is Batril, here is Nuflor, Draxin, Zactran, and Mycotil. Before exposure, to a single dose of Draxin, there is a very, very low prevalence of resistance in this group of cattle. We come back now in those same calves 10 to 14 days later, with the exception of drugs like Exceed, we see resistance from 70 to 99% of all of those isolates. One drug, one exposure, resistance to one, two, three different classes that we have analyzed here in this graph. If you take a look at all that we tested, 
six different antimicrobial classes, chemically distinct, are represented here with exposure to one. That's scary. Now, with that data, the concern about use of antimicrobials in animal agriculture, cross resistance to important human pathogens, you see these reports in lay publications. And this is one from Consumer Reports in 2015. And they're looking at, one, the percent of ground beef samples from local supermarkets that were contaminated with Salmonella, Clostridium, Staph, E. coli, Enterococcus, or then more than two types of bacteria in conventionally produced beef and more sustainably produced beef. And I'm not 100% sure what more sustainably produced actually means, but that's not important. The average consumer doesn't either. So the good news is there's no Salmonella. There's no more Clostridium between those two samples, but then we go and we look and see there's more Staph. Ah. There's more E. coli, and there's more samples with more than two types of bacteria. Again, people see that and it scares them a little bit. And then they take a look at this and they say, what proportion of these samples have superbugs there? What proportion of these samples have multi-drug resistant bacteria? Well, conventionally produced samples have 18% prevalence compared to sustainably produced, which is only 9% and then grass fed, which is 6%. And I'm not trying to denigrate any, any method of production at all. They all have their place. But again, the average consumer sees this and it shifts their preferences from uh, a, a, a one system to another. So what I tell people is, look at this, the average consumer, which is incredibly important for us, it doesn't pass the newspaper test. It, it, it doesn't fly by and large. When we look at changing consumer demands from 2004 to 2013, organic food sales in this country had increased from $11 billion to $32 billion. It's tripled in a 10 year period. Now, 11 of the 13 largest grocery retailers across this country are offering antibiotic free meat. Last week in Carrollton, I walked into Kroger because I forgot a few things on my way there and I needed to, to get a toothbrush and toothpaste and things like that. As I walked in the door on the sliding glass, it was a big sign plastered there that said, we now market antibiotic free meat. That's where we are and, and, and the consumer see that and see something a little bit better. We look now at multiple food chains like McDonald's and that's mostly symbolic, but McDonald's is sourcing antibiotic free meat. What if Walmart, what if JBS Five Rivers, what if, what if they started to change their preferences, what would happen to the beef cattle market if that were the case? So that's the background, that's how we got to where we are, and that's the, 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 the reason why we now start to look at the regulations. So before we get started, we have to understand a little bit of terminology because the VFD is based off this concept of a medically important antimicrobial. So to define that, the FDA and, and other organizations have come up with a, a, a set of terms to help them classify these drugs. So it could be a drug or a drug class used to treat pathogens that called foodborne disease. So that would be salmonella, something that we use to treat salmonella. So that would be ciprofloxacin, ceftriaxone. It could be a drug that is the sole therapy or one of few alternatives to treat serious human diseases. So that might be a drug that we're using to treat multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. It could be a drug or a drug class used to treat an enteric pathogen in non-foodborne illness, or there could be a drug which we can find no cross resistance within or between drug classes or difficulty transmitting elements between one bacteria or another. And so these reports again are based on these rankings and they rank them from critically, highly, or just important. Critically important drugs meet criteria one and two. So a critically important drug is here and here. A highly important drug meets criteria one or two, so it's here or here. And an important drug meets either three, four, or five, so it's here, here, or here, not all three. So that's, that's the classification scheme that they use. So when we look at what medically important drugs actually are, the easiest thing to do is remember what they aren't. Most of the drugs that we use in animal agriculture Penicillin, Naxil, Exenelic Seed, Ariomycin, LA200, Drax and Mycotil, Zactrans, Aprivo, Batril, Advacin, Albon, AS700. They're all classified as medically important using the scheme put forth by the classification organizations. And so now when we look at recent changes in antimicrobial use regulations, one that doesn't necessarily affect cattle producers as much as it does veterinarians is in April 2012, the FDA shouldn't say banned, but restricted 
our ability to use cephalosporins, so Naxil, XNL, and Exceed, in major food producing species. So again, it doesn't affect you as much as it does me, but there are some significant restrictions on how I can choose to use these in cattle, swine, and poultry. That same month, that same year, they published guidance for industry 209. And 209 was the framework for what we know as the VFD. That was the background. In December 2013, they published GFI 213, and that was the framework for the implementation of the measures that they proposed here in 209. This is the VFD as we know it. And so if we look at 209, again, it was just how the FDA saw judicious antimicrobial use. And what they said were there's two ways for us to use antimicrobials a little bit more judiciously. Is one, we limit the use of those medically important antimicrobials to uses that are necessary for assuring animal health. And what they implied with this was that using these drugs to promote growth and improve feed efficiency is not judicious. That's not necessary to assure animal health, so we don't see that as absolutely necessary. They also said that we should limit the use of antibiotics to uses that require veterinary oversight or consultation. So, although the VFD only affects feed and water, they were saying here that all antimicrobial use should involve the supervision of a veterinarian. That's, that's not how the VFD turned out, but, but that's what they implied again in 209, but that's, there's no policy that was set here. 213, again, was the policy arm of the VFD. And what this did was gradually and voluntarily phase out antimicrobial use for growth promotion and feed efficiency. Again, medically important drugs used in feed or water have to involve the input of a veterinarian. And then all in feed or water use of a VFD or prescription drug is prescription only. There's no more over the counter availability, again, of the medically important drugs. And GFI 213 gave a three-year period for pharmaceutical companies to comply. So it, went, it, it was published in December 31st, 2013, effective December 31st, 2016. It, it was you know, in action January 1 of this year. So the implications of those are that we can no longer use medically important drugs to promote growth or improve weight gain. That is illegal. I cannot write a prescription for that. And all in feed and water antimicrobial use, at least the medically important drugs, now requires the input of a veterinarian with a valid veterinary client patient relationship. Not only that, that veterinarian must be licensed in the state in which the animals are housed, regardless of the owner's address. So when we look at the drugs that are affected by the VFD regulations, the ones that are probably most important for us in beef cattle here in the Southeast would be Ariamycin and AS700. We, by and large, in beef cattle production here in the Southeast, don't use a lot of Thailand, we don't use a lot of Palmatil, and we don't use a lot of VMAX. Those are primarily feedlot antimicrobials. If we have dairy cattle, what is it gonna affect there? Primarily, medicated milk replaces, which could be teramycin, neoteramycin. If we're using these drugs to treat hairy hill warts in a dairy scenario too, those also, again, become prescription. So it's really these first four you have the biggest impact on. When we look at the drugs that are not affected by the VFD regulations, so drugs like Corid, GainPro, Decox, and the good news is the Onifors, Remensin, and Bovitec will not be affected by the VFD, and that is an important takeaway point from this. The VFD does not affect our ability to utilize Remensin or Bovitec in cattle production, unless we combine them in an approved combination with one of those other drugs. So for example, areomycin is approved to be fed in combination with Bovitec. If I'm using Bovitec by itself, there's no additional paperwork required. You can still feed that the way you feed it today. However, if I combine that now with areomycin and feed together, Bovitec essentially becomes a VFD feed. That's the one restriction there. Again, we can still use these drugs to promote, to treat and prevent disease. They're not changing our ability to use the drugs for disease prevention and disease treatment. So again, those of us who purchase high-risk stalker calves would use Draxin for rival metaphylaxis. That is allowed, at least for now. When we look at the economic impact of the VFD, from cattle production standpoint, we really don't know. There's not a lot of data out there to help us generate that. 
when we extrapolate from swine and poultry production, what we think is going to happen, and this is based off of data from the USDA economists, is that if we are using these drugs today for growth promotion, we're going to see a 1% to 3% increase in our cost of production. We're going to see a 1% increase in wholesale price at the consumer level, and we're going to see a 1% to 2% decrease in total production. Again, that's for the purposes of growth promotion. If we are not using these drugs for production purposes, and again, this is derived from swine and poultry data, so, so take it with a grain of salt, but it's the best we've got, we'll see an increase in production and higher revenues as a response to these things here. So if we're not using these things, we're actually going to be on the right end of the spectrum. We'll be okay. Other things that have happened, this is not you know, going to affect Georgia today, it will later, but Recently, California passed Senate Bill 27, and Senate Bill 27 goes into effect in 2018. Senate Bill 27 in California contains the most restrictive antimicrobial use guidelines in the nation. What this bill does, it removes all medically important drugs from over-the-counter status. Not just feed, injectables too. So as of 2018, in the state of California, you can no longer go into a tractor supply or other similar place and buy penicillin, LA-200, Thailand or Albon over the counter. Those drugs will then require a prescription. Okay? Doesn't affect us today, but there is some thought that this will be something that goes nationwide in the next few years. So it's coming. So what the future holds is really hard to predict. We do think that more restrictive regulations are coming. We already know that the FDA is targeting undefined feeding periods of certain drugs in cattle production. So for example, Thailand and some doses of areomycin can be fed for the entire feeding period. There's no restriction on how long we can do that. That's being targeted next. The FDA's already put out a call for comments on that. So that will change. So when we look at this now, we've got to look at management strategies to maximize animal health. We don't have crutches anymore to help prevent disease like we did in the past. We've got to focus on biosecurity. We've got to focus on vaccination, deworming. Preconditioning has to become a priority for us, again, to make sure that we have access to the markets that we need to have access to. So the takeaways, what cattle producers need to know, dairy or beef, is develop a relationship with a veterinarian that knows your operation. If you don't have a veterinarian that knows your operation, find one. Develop a veterinary client-patient relationship. Make sure that that's in place. So if a problem does arise and you need something in feed, the red tape's already taken care of. Other things that we need to do is focus on antimicrobial stewardship. Is there something that's not an antibiotic that would work just as well? Could we use something rather than focusing on treating cattle all the time? Can we prevent the disease? Again, that goes to respiratory disease and high-risk calves. Preconditioning really works. Now, no matter how well we do it, we will see disease. There's no way around that. And so when we see disease, we make sure we pick drugs that are safe and effective for different purposes. Just because penicillin and LA-200 are there and available doesn't mean they're really the best. So antimicrobial stewardship means we focus on disease prevention. We try to keep it out. When we have sickness, we diagnose it quickly and accurately. I see too many times where veterinarians, too, go out into the field, lame cow, and they give her a dose of LA-200, hexazole, whatever it may be. Come back, take a look, but she didn't respond, and lo and behold, she's got a torn cruciate. And there's nothing that any antibiotic is going to do to fix that cruciate. So let's make sure we have the right diagnosis before we decide to treat them with an antimicrobial. Again, we select drugs that are appropriate for the condition being treated, and we keep records of our patterns of drug use. Not just so we know how long it is before she can be marketed, then we figure out, wow, we're seeing a lot of this, why? And then go back to the root cause of it so we don't see it anymore. Other things, again, establish a veterinary client-patient relationship. Have that there. Establish written treatment protocols on the farm. There's no reason that a veterinarian needs to be there, and some people may think this is blasphemous, to treat every cow with every disease. I think you can treat a case of pink eye just as well as I can. But I like to make sure that my clients have what they need on that farm to do it the right way. Understand what constitutes extra label drug use. What's legal and what's illegal as it relates to antimicrobial use. Again, we go back to the example of things like uh, using aromycin for pink eye or foot rot. I get that question a lot. Can we use aromycin to, to treat pink eye? Can we use aromycin to treat foot rot still? No, I mean, you never could. That's, that was illegal then. That's illegal now. There's more oversight of that process today. Uh, another example of that would be, I see people that use 
drugs like Bechtel and Advacyn for pink eye. Not that it doesn't work, but it is really illegal. And then understand that sometimes we aren't going to be the ones out there and make sure that the personnel doing the day-to-day -day tasks have the resources they need. They're trained the right way to do these things. I talked about preconditioning, and a lot of people see preconditioning as a dirty word, but it works. They gain more efficiently, they get sick less often, and they cost less from a medication perspective. Again, they still get sick. It's going to happen, but there's less of it there. So finish up. I, I, there's no question that what we do in animal agriculture has contributed to resistance. There's no doubt about that. We play a role. Now, are we the only? No. There, there, there's definitely a component from human medicine, too. But no matter what we think, our patterns of use must change because we have to. The FDA is mandating that we do, so we can't ignore this. It's been in effect now for a little over three weeks, and it is the most common phone call that I get now. This is, this is something that, 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 that people are struggling with. And we've got to start looking at management. It has to become a priority. I, I, I think as time goes on, it's going to be necessary. We can maintain marketing opportunities. I think opportunities on high-risk cattle may be lost one day. Not today, not tomorrow, but one day. So if you want to maintain doors to some of these markets, we've got to start looking at some of these techniques, preconditioning otherwise, to help us stay viable. That. Uh, well, Brent's got to go back and teach class. Does anybody have any questions for him before we cut him loose? Why? One back here. Is there a way to make that happen? We're going to put these up on the Ag Forecast website, and so you'll be able to get them from there once we get get done with the series here, which is today. So, <laughs> but we I want to just take a few minutes to thank. Brent, he, uh, he's traveled around all North Georgia with us, and he's done an excellent job, and we appreciate him taking the time out to do this and providing a lot of really good information for folks. And we will we sent something to your house to remind you of your little road trip with us, so uh, when you enjoy that, you can think about this. But let's all give him another hand, and we really, really appreciate it. All right, we're gonna, we've kind of mixed things up here a little bit and we can have Dr. Campbell come up uh, to talk about some of the forecast materials. Also too, if you look at your place, you have an Ag Forecast book. It's got a lot of detailed information on the topics we're covering today as well as other topics. We collect information at the university here on about 82 different commodities. We all put, put all that together in our farm gate value report by county, by commodity. That's a big book. If you're sleepy, you can look at that. It'll knock you out. But we've tried to condense it into the little snapshot book there, which gives you just an overview of Georgia agriculture by commodities. Uh, please take a look at that. If you look in the back, there's a listing of all the counties in the state of Georgia, uh, agriculture's economic contribution to that particular county, as well as the number of people that are employed in agriculture or, or associated industries in that particular county. So. Take a few minutes and look at that. If you have any questions on the forecast today, all the contributing authors are listed in the back. Uh, the two gentlemen are coming up now are with Ag Economics, and there are two new faculty members, but they're, uh, they've got some great information for you. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Campbell. Well, welcome, and thank you for being here. Uh, so I'm not, I don't like standing behind a podium, so if I get a little jittery, it's because I want to roam around, and so, uh, so I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Agriculture and Applied Economics. Uh, my area of focus is what I really deal with is the green industry, also known as the environmental horticulture industry. <clears throat> but today I've got the pleasure of discussing the green industry, but also fruit and vegetable forecasts. Um, with the fruit and, for the fruit and vegetable uh, specialist being Dr. Greg Fonza, who's at the Tifton campus. Um, so when we look at the green industry, <clears throat> generally it's made up of production, distribution, wholesale, retail, retail services um, for nurture, greenhouse, floor culture, and turf grass. All right. A lot of people don't know, back in 2006, the green industry was the second biggest uh, farm gate value commodity in the state. After the recession hit, we dropped to right, aside, uh, right at the top, uh, right at number five level. So we're in the top five with respect to how big we are. Um, when you think of size, it's a $7.6 billion industry in the state, and we account for everything outside of, of just production. Roughly counting, employing roughly 80,000 80, Georgians. So it's quite a big industry. 
Um, so I want to show this graph to give you an idea of where we were back in 2006 and where we are now in a tie it to the economy as a whole. Back in 2006, before the recession hit, um, environmental horticulture was doing really well. The economy was booming, and so sales were exploding. Um, when the recession hit, things changed. Georgia State product, which gives an idea of how the state was doing, uh, dropped, and it has recovered. All right, so it has been recovery. Fairly quickly, the Georgia economy recovered. As far as agriculture in general, 2006, it, it started uh, decreased, but it recovered as well, right? So as a whole, the state and ag have recovered within Georgia. When we go to looking at environmental horticulture, the green industry, the same thing didn't happen. Environmental horticultural dropped quite extensively in the, uh, years after the recession hit. And it's just now trying to get somewhere near that 2006 value. When we break it down by sector, you know, the greenhouse sector within the environmental horticulture has finally exceeded and got to the point where it is recovered to the point where it was in 2006. Nursery, container, and turf grass haven't recovered. Turf grass is 50% of what it was in 2006. Container and nursery are still nowhere near what they were at 2006 levels. Right? So the economy, compared to a lot of other, um, the greenhouse industry, compared to a lot of other commodities, it's really directly tied to what's happening in the economy. So we're gonna spend the next little bit talking about the Georgia economy and the national economy, because what happens there is gonna dictate what happens with green industry in the state of Georgia. One thing's different than what happens with a lot of commodities. The government tracks prices and quantities of a lot of commodities with respect to peanuts and livestock and things like that. We don't track the green industry products. From 1966 to 2006, there was a yearly track of things happening within the industry. 2006, that stopped. <clears throat> so for as far as information with respect to what happened, prices or quantities, it's not available. So what we rely on is, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at the economy as a whole to try to figure out where are we going. So that's what we're gonna do today is to quickly is to try to look out and see what's happening in the Georgia economy, where do we expect it to go, all right? So one of the big things we look at is housing starts, right? You build a house, generally you're buying plants, you're buying turf, you're buying all these things. So housing starts is one of the things we look at to try to figure out what's happening. So as you can see, it's sort of an up and down relationship with respect to what's happened. Happened. 2006, big drop, we've trended upwards. So housing starts are trending in the right direction as far as how it'll affect the green industry. So we do see housing starts increasing, which is good news. Closer look, you know, we are trending up housing start wise. You know, you have some variability there, but overall we do see a trend upwards, which is good news. It gives an idea that, you know, there may be de demand out there um, on the horizon. It's not equivalent across regions, right? So if we look at the Northeast, they've had slow growth in 2000, 2015, 2016, Growth will even decrease on housing starts. For the South, we do have moderate growth, not as much as the Midwest, but we do see growth. So if you're a green industry firm and you are selling to the Northeast, that's your main market. You can expect demand more likely be a lot slower than if you're selling in the South or if you're other regions. GDP, looking at sort of, what well, this is sort of the gauge we use to try to understand what's happening in the economy. You know, we saw it go down, we've seen it fluctuate. You know, we're increasing relatively slowly with respect to growth, right? Good news is we're increasing. Bad news is it's slow. But it's another indicator we're trying to get, put all these things together to understand what is going on with the economy, because that's, we've seen, it correlates very uh, well with the green industry growth. Look at Georgia, state product, you know, 2017, expected growth is around 2.5%, right? So we do see growth, not as much as we like, but we do see a trend upwards. So if we look at housing starts trending upwards. We see growth of uh, the Georgia state and the U.S. Um, economy inch inching upwards. There are signs there that for the green industry, there should be growth in the future. We look at breaking it down by metropolitan areas. Given that the green industry in Georgia is very highly concentrated in this area around Atlanta, 
you know, it's good that this is in this darker blue color because we see that the growth rate in that area is higher than it is in other parts of the state. So if you're focusing in the Atlanta area, the expectation is you're going to have more demand than if you're doing somewhere else um, in other places. So we see signs looking at housing starts, looking at growth, looking at growth in Atlanta, that there's this projection that we can start to formulate that there is some kind of increase probably hopefully coming with the green industry. Keeping continuing on with uh, consumer spending, we see that trending up as well. So another indicator, good sign for the industry. Personal consumption expenditures, again, another uh, measure to see that we're trending up. It's sort of stabilized a little bit, but it is trending up. At least it's not going down, right? So we're trending upwards. So we see all these things indicating that there is some growth. It's not, it's not extreme. It's not a huge amount of growth, but we do have growth. See unemployment rate. Unemployment rate is trended down. It's sort of stabilized. Right, it's stabilized around 5%. Um, when you look at the Georgia growth rate, we're around the same thing as it was, is for the U.S. Right. So it's not going up. So this is an indication that, you know, for the economy-wise, we're at least growing a little bit. So there is a trend upwards, which is good news for the green industry. But it all depends on how we uh, look at demand with respect to the green industry is a lot of it is sold countywide. So if you're a garden center, you sell it to your county. So the uh, forecast for you is maybe different from somebody in some other part of the state. You know, we see that uh, unemployment rate up in this area, Atlanta. Again, we see growth. With respect to, we see growth in the economy. Unemployment rate really is, is decreasing. So these are all fat signs we're looking at to try to project because we don't have data. We don't have prices that we can look at for the last 10 years, five years. So we're using these signs as an indicator of what's happening. What do we think is going to happen? So what do we think is going to happen? Well, I think there's going to be slow growth, very slow growth for the whole of the industry. That doesn't imply that every green industry firm is going to have slow growth. Those that are being very proactive and are finding new markets and are trying to do new things, engaging new customers, will have higher growth. But overall, as an industry, I think it's going to be very slow. The industry is going to be marked by a lot more price competition. So we're going to have slow growth. Price competition is really going to be a driver in the industry. Other factors we're looking at, household incomes. Household incomes in the state are increasing roughly at the same rate that they are in the U.S. But they are increasing. So that's a good sign that lends credence that there should be some growth. One of the things that's going to be that it hurts because we know that the green industry plants and turf are generally considered uh, luxuries. They're not things that we go out and buy as a necessity. That when people worry about what's happening or feel that there's the economies at risk, we cut back on those things that we don't really, those luxury items. One of the factors that creates risk is when a new president comes in, a new administration, doesn't matter who it is, it's just that we get nervous with respect to changes. So changes happen, one party controlling things, people get nervous. So this is a little indicator that, you know, we may see people pulling back from buying those luxury items, which is not good news from the green, for the grain industry. Whether well, something else that we have to worry about. Forecast for the uh, spring season is that it should be a normal spring uh, weather-wise. There's also another indication or forecast that says that what the winter will prolong into the spring a little bit more than usual, right? What do we know for green industry? Cold weather, people don't go buy plants. They don't go buy turf, right? So if we have colder weather, it could dampen the spring season, which is the big season for these commodities. We also know that things we can't control with respect to when it rains. If it rains on Fridays and Saturdays, demand goes down. Commodity could be, uh, the economy could be roaring, rains on Fridays and Saturdays, people don't go by, right? So a lot of this expectation of growth is centered on what happens on those last couple days of the week. One of the big things that we have to look for or look at is what's going to happen that may, with, that may dampen increased growth. It's what's happening with water and labor. Increased growth is good, but if our input, input costs go up, that's an issue. With labor, the grain industry relies heavily on um, immigrant labor. If that labor disappears, costs go up, and it could dampen growth with respect to the industry. If water becomes scarce, 
We can't water our uh, crops. Or if we have to pay more for it, that's another indicator that, um, that could dampen the growth. So overall forecast projection is that for the green industry, we're gonna have slow growth. We're gonna have, a, there's gonna be a lot of issues out there that could really hurt the industry, especially with regards to labor, weather, and uh, water. Right. So that's sort of the green industry, slow growth with some uh, challenges ahead. Uh, when we look at the um, fruit and vegetables, so fruit and vegetable farm gate uh, for fruit, and vegetables, and tree nuts was around, for Georgia, was around 1.8 billion. One billion of that's vegetables. So it's a, quite a considerable uh, sector of the, uh, the Georgia economy, ag economy. The USDA estimates that farm value for vegetable pulses and melons will increase by 1.3% in 2017, with an increase of 1.5% acreage. So acreage is going to go up, but also farm value will go up. So for vegetable pulses and melons, we see a projected increase in the value there. Fresh market pulses and vegetables, it, the value is expected to increase um, with processed farm value for pulses and vegetables remaining flat. All right, so farm market's increasing, the processed remaining flat. The fresh market farm values will, should dominate the 20, 2017 sales. Free fruit, tree nut farm value is roughly expected to increase by 2.6%. So we see an increase expected for fruit and tree nuts. Fresh processed vegetable exports are expected to increase as well. To coincide with this, we also see that per capita consumption for fresh and processed um, vegetables is increasing. So with this increase per capita, people are demanding more, eat consuming more, it's forecast that uh, Demand is going to increase, which also in return should have an increase in the production and imports growth in these uh, areas. So fruits and vegetables forecast is a little bit brighter than it was, I think, for the green industry. But looking for individual commodities. So with peaches. In peaches, we see that there's an, uh, roughly there was a decrease in uh, volume produced production. <clears throat> it's relatively stabled off, uh, stabilized. Prices have gone up as the uh, reduction in production, but they're starting beginning to stabilize as well. But it varies throughout the season, right? So if you're hitting the market in June, May, June, higher prices than if you hit the market later in the season. With 2016 having quite a bit more variability than some of the other years. So it's forecast wise, how you do with respect to prices, is a lot of times when you hit the market. For apples, we see a little bit growth of production. We see prices increasing as well. This could be a function of increased per capita, per capita use. Apple prices, again, we see roughly we're in line with what's happening uh, in 2016. Apple was roughly the same as 20, 2011, 2013 which are above 2015 and 2014, right? But there is variability. And depending on when you're on the market, that's gonna dictate what time of prices you're gonna get. For strawberries, we see increased demand or increased production over the last several years. Maybe looks like it's sort of capped off or peaked in 2014, 15. It's like there's a reduction happening now. And prices have, in 2015, have decreased. There was an upper trend. Looks like they've turned the corner, maybe heading downward. Again, as with peaches and apples, it's when you hit the market forecast. We can, we can forecast and say you're gonna have higher low prices, but it depends on when you're on the market, right? If you're hitting the market at the beginning of the year or at the end of the year in missing peak season, prices are higher. For pecans, Pecan uh, acreage production has roughly been stable over the last couple of years, but prices have increased. So we expect that trend to continue. Grapes production has increased, but we've seen prices relatively stagnant the last couple of years. Trended down and they've sort of stagnated as of over 2014, 15, 16. So we expect that to continue. But again, a lot of this comes down to when you market. When are you hitting the, when are you hitting the, your, when is your product hit the door? 
So if you're one of the, if you're one of the, in the sort of the early stages, higher prices than if you're in the middle when everyone else is producing. For leaf and no man's lettuce production, we've seen increased production. Right. Increased production, generally we see decreased prices. Um, so, you know, production could be an issue with lettuce. Big table, what's interesting here is what's happening in Georgia. Late 90s, we had a lot of production of tomatoes in Georgia. Well, it's decreased quite a bit. Now we're down to a, half, excuse me, a third of what we were in the late 90s, right? But production's gone down. But what's of interest is opportunity-wise. Per capita use of tomatoes has gone up. So Georgia production's decreased. By and large, demand for tomatoes has gone up. So opportunity-wise for Georgia producers, tomatoes could be something that, you know, you see demand from the consumer side that could be an area that we could invest in. Bell peppers, again, another thing that has per capita use has increased. So we're seeing demand increase. So overall, fruit and vegetable demand or prices, or especially demand, has gone up. And they're forecast to go up in 2017. Same thing for vegetables and uh, tree nuts. So as these goes up, it hopefully creates opportunities for producers to look at these commodities as potential um, areas they can invest in. So that's a uh, green industry, which we expect a slow growth in demand. We expect uh, challenges with respect to labor and weather and water. For fruits and vegetables, we see a little bit more brighter outlook that fruits and vegetables will increase, it'll be increased acres, but also increased value. And we also see per capita consumption for a lot of these fruits and vegetables increasing, which is a good sign. Great. Thank you. Well, thanks for uh, the information, Ben, and I'll uh, uh, look forward to sharing some information about um, our livestock and poultry industries, um, and additionally, <clears throat> talking more about uh, our row crops in Georgia. Um, <clears throat> my name is Levi Russell. I'm the uh, livestock economist, uh, <clears throat> extension economist uh, here uh, in, at the University of Georgia, and I'm also in the same department with Ben. Uh, like Ben, I'm new here. I've been here for about six months, um, and previously I've been in Texas. Um, and as you can tell from my accent, I'm from Kansas originally. So, uh, <laughs> so start off, uh, start off talking a little bit about beef cattle. Um, <clears throat> in the state of Georgia, uh, most of our beef uh, beef cattle production happens at the what we call the cow calf level, and so. <clears throat> uh, in terms of profitability uh, from the cost perspective, uh, that segment of the market is, is a lot more sensitive to pasture conditions than it is to things like corn prices. So there's gonna be kind of a shift. Uh, I'm gonna be talking more about profitability from that angle here. And then when I move into the other uh, protein commodities, I'm um, we'll gonna be talking a lot more about uh, feed costs, which you can sort of, uh, sort of interpret as uh, corn prices. Uh, so from the supply side on the beef cattle, uh, industry in general, looking at sort of the nationwide picture over the last several decades, um, we've seen, we saw inventories uh, increase through the 1970s um, and then start to decline. Again, this is inventories in terms of total head. Uh, we're a lot more efficient producers now, um, so this decline in head doesn't necessarily mean um, a decline in, in total meat produced. Um, but you can see that there's some sort of regular pattern to these, this inventory, right? Um, we kind of have our little local peaks and local troughs there. Um, we'll have a couple of years of increase and then followed by several years of decline, a couple of years of increase, several years of decline. And it'll be a little more obvious why this is the case uh, here in a little bit. But what I want to point out with this slide is just where we are right now. So over the last few years, couple of years, uh, we have been on an uptick in terms of total inventory. And so... <clears throat> The big story of the last five years or so um, in beef cattle has been uh, drought in the Western US where a lot of our production is. 
Um, and that has led to declining inventories and dramatically increased prices in 2014 uh, and 15. So <clears throat> those high prices uh, led to uh, efforts to expand and that expansion has made prices crash uh, very quickly uh, in 2015. Um, and so <clears throat> we're just kind of, just sort of put your economics hat on and think, okay, if supply is increasing, um, then that generally means prices are coming down. So that's kind of the story over the last couple of years here very recently. Um, <clears throat> but we're starting to see things normalize a little bit in terms of that total picture of, of supply. So here are cattle slaughter numbers, and this is a weekly number, so it jumps around a lot, and you can see those big drops whenever there's, uh, whenever there's a holiday, and so they're, they're off for a day during that week, and so uh, the slaughter uh, declines dramatically for that week. But what you'll see throughout my presentation here are, are graphs that look like this. The red is always a five-year average from 2010 to 14. The dotted blue line is, is 2015, and the solid blue line is 2016. So that'll give you a feel for kind of where, how you're supposed to read this. So what we can see is that in 2015, our slaughter was down uh, pretty dramatically relative to that five-year average. And a lot of this was due to um, uh, serious efforts to expand the herd in 2015 and so um, this is a, a total cattle slaughter number so this will include um, heifer slaughter um, you know our, our just the standard uh, steers which we usually think of, of, of as giving us those higher quality beef products um, and also cows as well uh, so those those numbers were down and again that, that was a big part of that expansion um, and you can see though in 2016 uh, that blue line starts to trail back up towards that five-year average there. And so that re that, what that tells you is, is that we're starting to sort of normalize those inventory numbers uh, over the next couple of years, um, and we're increasing that slaughter. We've increased slaughter of cows, um, the older cows. We've increased our slaughter of the younger cows that would have otherwise gone on to have calves at some point. Okay, and so these are sort of pushing us to think, okay, our inventory is gonna to start to turn around uh, to some extent and move into more of a flat pattern over the next couple of years. <clears throat> From the demand side, um, we've had a lot of really good news, I think, on the beef side of things. Um, <clears throat> of course, all beef prices went up dramatically um, <clears throat> uh, a, a few years ago, but in 15, we did see a big drop in our uh, low quality, lower quality beef products, uh, the ground product. Um, however, <clears throat> if we think about those middle meat cuts, uh, the higher quality stuff, your steaks and things like that, uh, those prices have stayed fairly high. And so um, you can see that 16 number is higher than that five-year average, uh, but of course lower than the 2015 number. So this will be good news for us uh, in terms of beef cattle prices. I think our, our calf prices are going to um, sort of receive some support from this um, going into the next couple of years as um, a lot of that production of beef starts to hit the market um, and move into uh, the grocery store. <clears throat> so this is sort of the uh, uh, money slide in terms of profitability. So what you're seeing in the blue is similar to that first slide with those inventories and uh, moving around uh, at the national level. And then the bars in the black and red, those are sort of estimates of profitability at the national level, kind of a bird's eye view. Um, <clears throat> and so what you notice is uh, with high calf prices in 14 and 15, really high profits there, right? And you can see that that sort of spurred an increase in inventories, right? You can see it pretty much times, pretty much, pretty consistently here, when inventories are high, profits are low. And when inventories are at a low point, profits are high. So it's just sort of an economic story. We've got a lot of, if we've got a lot of cattle out there, our, we have lower profits because prices are lower. So the incentive is to reduce the herd. And as we move through time, we reduce that herd down and we get to a low point when prices have climbed back up, right? As we've reduced the herd, prices have risen. Um, and so there's another incentive to increase the herd again for a couple of years. So at this point, uh, really, as far as projecting prices for the future, uh, a big component of this is going to be where are our uh, consumers going to be, and I think uh, there's some good things to say about uh, folks sort of improving their perspective as to what they think about 
uh, beef products in general. Um, <clears throat> but from the supply side, I think we're starting to turn the corner on inventories. Uh, 17, we're still gonna see another negative uh, profit number there, sort of from that bird's eye view at the national level. Um, but <clears throat> uh, I think that will kind of help us turn the corner um, on those inventories and sort of flatten out in 17 and 18. Uh, looking at prices, so price forecasts for Georgia for the next year. Um, so this is what I uh, sort of uh, supposedly at least hang my hat on and hopefully not my salary on, but um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> again, you see the sort of same pattern with the, with the, uh, with the, the, the different years here. Um, in 15, uh, that big drop in price that I mentioned, uh, you can see that very clearly there. Um, I think that had a lot to do with uh, sort of the, uh, the demand side finally responding to those higher beef prices um, and also <clears throat> us starting to uh, increase our herd there. Uh, so we saw 15 prices fall um, and then we did see a little bit of a normalization for a few months in 2016 there at the beginning. Um, and so keep in mind, these are Georgia prices uh, for sort of our market steers, okay? So we saw a bit of a recovery there, and then in the spring, we had a drop and then another big drop starting in August in price there in that blue line. Uh, but thankfully, in the middle of October, we started to see things improve. Um, and I think part of this has to do with, again, kind of figuring out where that floor is on consumer demand, uh, but also <clears throat> the signal of uh, increased slaughter um, and starting to uh, sort of turn the corner on those inventories. Uh, I think those kind of two went together to tell us that most likely uh, this is kind of where we're going to turn the corner and start moving sideways at least a little bit on prices. So if you look at those two arrows I have there, uh, that's kind of where I see kind of the high point and the low point for prices throughout uh, 2017 uh, for these market steers here in the state of Georgia. Uh, <clears throat> as far as that high point goes, we'll see that sometime in uh, March. And that low point we'll see uh, right around Thanksgiving uh, uh, or sometime between uh, the end of October and the end of November um, <clears throat> for 2017. <clears throat> so just to wrap up here, uh, we'll continue to see a return to sort of normal supply and demand fundamentals um, and also sort of a return to um, a more normal um, <clears throat> uh, trade fundamentals. So uh, we've, had, uh, we've had increasing exports and decreasing imports uh, of course, when we, when we uh, had our big drought in the Western U.S. Um, and had a big decline in our total beef supplies, uh, we were, you know, importing a lot of beef to make up for that, um, and our exports went down. But we have seen that start to normalize, which is a, a good sign. Um, <clears throat> uh, we'll expect a seasonal price pattern uh, consistent with current prices. So that's kind of where I'm thinking, you know, we're going to move up uh, potentially a little bit uh, through the spring and then uh, back down a bit uh, through the end of the year. Uh, we're going to sort of seeing the, the, uh, the end of expansion over the next two years or so. I'm going to expect to turn, uh, turn, the ca uh, turn the corner on the cattle cycle, um, which should help us on prices to some extent uh, going into 18. Uh, <clears throat> the big, as I said at the beginning, the big factor, the big cost factor for profitability in this, at this uh, part of the supply chain in beef cattle uh, really is our pasture conditions. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, as we know here in North Georgia, those have not been good over the last year, um, but hopefully we will continue to see some recovery in those. We've seen a little bit of a recovery um, in certain parts of the, of the state, uh, moved out of the worst drought conditions and into the second worst, which you know isn't much, isn't great, but um, it is somewhat of an improvement and hopefully we'll continue to see that. So looking at the poultry side, um, and when I talk about poultry, uh, hogs and dairy, um, I'm gonna kind of have a consistent story. And that story is going to be low feed costs, uh, really high production, okay? Um, and so I'll talk about how uh, those, those things have affected those specific industries, um, but also keep in mind uh, sort of competing meats. So um, if someone goes to the grocery store and their intention is to buy, let's say they're going to go buy some chicken, okay? If the price of pork is lower than they expected, then they might go and buy pork instead, right? So as far as chicken prices go, what does that mean? It's going to put downward pressure on the chicken price, right? So if we've got a lot of production on the market for all of these proteins, that's going to contribute to downward pressure on all of those protein prices. <clears throat> so 
So looking at poultry um, and starting off with that production number in terms of, um, you know, this is our federally inspected weekly slaughter. Um, you can see that, uh, again, looking at that same uh, color coding, uh, that our production is really high for 16 um, and, and uh, consistent with 15 to some extent, but we're about 3% higher um, in, in 16 than we were in 15. Uh, 15 saw a really big dramatic growth relative to that five-year average. Um, so we have seen some increase in production. We did have some issues, and, and of course there's a lot more detail in your book there. Um, we did have some production issues. Uh, we had some meat quality issues uh, called woody breast um, that did uh, hurt us to some extent. We had some disappointing exports, um, <clears throat> um, and especially uh, uh, that, that's going to really affect our dark meat products. Um, and so sort of contributing both of those things together to uh, dramatically lower prices in 16. What about going forward for the next few years? Uh, <clears throat> again, looking out, you can see our 16 production uh, much, much higher than that five-year average from 11 to 15. Um, and we'll expect to see in 17 uh, a little bit more growth in production. And the reason for this mainly is, again, uh, those relatively low feed costs. So we've had corn prices um, sort of in the mid threes um, on the futures market. And so that really has contributed to increasing production uh, <clears throat> in the broiler and hog side uh, and also in dairy. Um, <clears throat> so the bottom line here is that since we're going to see increases in production um, and we're going to continue to potentially have some issues um, with trade from a strong dollar perspective, um, <clears throat> we're, going to re we're going to rely on those low feed costs to, um, <clears throat> to keep uh, producer margins from narrowing further. Uh, looking at broiler prices, um, again, we've seen in 16, uh, relatively low, a bit of a, a bump there in the middle of the year back towards our average. And um, <clears throat> just sort of consistent in general throughout the last part of the year with those low prices in 15. And again, a lot of this is driven by um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, so some really uh, difficult times as far as exports go. Uh, the only, you know, what we say, usually we say, you know, don't expect high prices to last. And, and the way we say that is the cure for high prices is high prices. And we can say that I think on the other side too. If we have low prices, um, sort of nominal prices uh, here in the U.S. for our, for our uh, poultry products, um, that is going to help us out on the export side. So again, taking account of the fact that our dollar's pretty strong right now, um, <clears throat> hopefully these lower prices will help us um, to be a little more competitive on the export side. So just to wrap up for the poultry side, <clears throat> expect continued increases in production, but slower growth than in 16. Um, <clears throat> our exports are really gonna be um, a big uh, component of what happens. Uh, to our prices, mainly because um, we're going to really rely on them that, to uh, take up a lot of that increased uh, production that we have. We have some ability to get uh, folks to eat a little bit more of these meat products, but um, we really aren't forecasting uh, huge increases in sort of per person consumption of any of these meat products I'm going to talk about. Uh, competing meats, that was something I mentioned at the beginning, competing meats will add downward pressure to prices. So um, as our hog production continues to increase, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, we'll continue to see downward pressure on chicken prices. Um, and again, low feed costs are going to be the big thing for determining our profitability. Looking at the hog markets, <clears throat> here we have again a similar uh, picture to that first slide um, on the poultry side. Uh, high, high production. Uh, relative to that five-year average, and especially at the end of the year, um, you can see there the blue line exceeds that top thin line there at 2,500 or 2.5 million, really. Um, but that 2.5 million number is important because that is a, a pretty good gauge of what our capacity for slaughter in the U.S. had been in 2016. Okay, so when we increase past that point, um, those <clears throat> processes are having to incur a lot more cost than usual uh, just to deal with that extra um, production. So, of course, that's a, that's a really big concern for prices, um, and it did have an impact on prices um, fairly late in the year there, but uh, we saw things turn around to some extent, and you'll see that in just a minute. Um, but that is a concern. Um, into 17, we're going to expect our capacity to increase. We have some more capacity coming online uh, across the country. Um, and so hopefully that will help us uh, as we continue to see 
uh, increased production yet again through 2017 on the hog side. So again, if you look at that light blue compared to the dark blue, not as big of a jump when we're looking at the red relative to the dark blue. Okay, so we're looking at 16's increase was a lot bigger than we're expecting 17's increase to be. Um, <clears throat> but again, we've got these same issues, competing meats, um, and really a lot of this being driven by those lower feed costs. So looking at feeder pig prices, similar story to poultry. Um, we did have, uh, at the beginning of the year, um, we did have some really strong exports to China and Hong Kong. Um, and those, those markets are really gonna be important on the hog side. Um, more than any of these protein products, um, the hog sector relies on exports. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, that, that, that stronger demand from China is gonna be important. And uh, I just read a report recently that showed that, showed that um, as incomes increase on a per capita basis in China, um, they're consuming more protein products as we'd expect. Um, but the thing is, the cost structure uh, for hog production in China is about double what it is here in the US. So that's a real opportunity, I think. Um, we'll, we'll again see some increase in domestic consumption of hog, of, of our pork products. But again, we're gonna rely on those exports um, and those relatively low prices we have to sort of spur some of that growth and help us out competitively. These are projected uh, after the blue line there to the right of the blue line, you see projected profits for a farrow to finish operation in Iowa. Um, and th this is really the, uh, actually it's one of my old graduate school colleagues who's up there now. Um, and this is kind of his uh, projection for where we're gonna see profits in the hog sector go. Um, and what I would say is really all you need to do is to take those profit numbers and just move them down a bit um, to sort of adjust them for Georgia because our costs are a little higher here. Um, but you can see sort of a seasonal, uh, sort of our seasonal uh, strength in prices comes through the sort of the spring and summer on the, on the hog side. And so we'll see some increases in profits there as again, feed, feed costs remain low. Um, but then by the end of the year, um, that seasonal weakness in price is gonna get us uh, and, and, and drive profits below uh, zero. <clears throat> so to wrap up the hog side, slower growth in production, um, again, hopefully assisted by some uh, increases in packing capacity um, that, you know, that will kind of help us uh, potentially to have some profit opportunities. Um, <clears throat> again, the competing meats issue. Um, exports, again, are really a, a big part of the hog market. And um, <clears throat> we're, we're, you know, we, we really will need to see uh, not only increases in the domestic side, but uh, sort of some, some increases in our, our exports to China. Um, <clears throat> so as far as uh, profits, um, you know, we will see some of those recover again on, on seasonality, uh, you know, with seasonally higher uh, hog prices, but uh, we're gonna depend on those feed costs staying low. Uh, from the dairy perspective, um, on the dairy side, we've continued to see increases in um, the herd throughout, through the end of the year, uh, even though we've had relatively low uh, milk prices. So kind of like I showed you at the beginning of the beef uh, uh, discussion, uh, I showed you an inventory graph. Well, here is a milk price chart going back um, <clears throat> quite a long time here. And so you can see um, every time we have a peak with those red diamonds there, uh, we increase that price about 11% relative to the previous peak. Okay, and so that's sort of, a, um, <clears throat> sort of where we see milk prices moving. And so we wanna kind of project that next peak and when that's gonna happen and how high it's gonna be. And that will help us understand, uh, you know, how we're gonna get there. As you see, there's sort of a recovery process in those prices. So where are we at right now? Uh, increased production. So this is US production. I don't have a, sorry, I don't have a, a, some wording up there to tell you what this is, but this is uh, increases, uh, this shows some increases in US production of milk. Uh, again, you can look at the blue line is 14. Um, we saw an increase in 15 with that orange line and then another increase in green um, in 2016. And this is driven by two things, increases in the dairy herd, okay, on low feed costs and increases in production per cow. So uh, really, you know, kind of two factors really pushing up the production numbers there. Uh, looking at sort of a broader uh, picture uh, that are gonna help us, I think, understand uh, prices a little better. In the yellow, you have a three country production total. Okay, and so 
uh, well, we should say really three regions, but uh, the US, Europe, and New Zealand, okay, are kind of the three big competitors as far as um, <clears throat> the global markets are concerned um, with our dairy. And, and again, that's that, in terms of that export sector, that's really talking more about our dry product. The green line is US all milk price. And so you can see again, a relatively simple supply demand story. As we've increased uh, production in our three regions, that yellow line has increased over time, we've seen milk prices fall. So <clears throat> the good news on this is um, that we have seen Europe's production start to wane a little bit, start to decrease, um, and New Zealand as well to some extent. And so that's uh, gonna help us be competitive, I think, um, on the world market. Looking at dairy margins and sort of explaining why we continue to see an increase in the herd uh, through the end of the year, um, is that our margins have strengthened uh, through the end of the year last year um, and are projected to sort of continue uh, at roughly that same level of margin there. Um, and when I say dairy margin, um, what I'm looking at is just sort of some measure of the difference between the price of the product and the, uh, the cost of the inputs there. And so again, I, I think uh, we're in a pretty good scenario as far as uh, dairy production goes uh, on margins. We're gonna continue to see um, <clears throat> probably increases in the herd on low feed costs, but um, we have seen some positive signs on prices. So looking at the all milk price across the US will be somewhere between 17 and $19 uh, for this year. Georgia mailbox prices tend to be higher, and so we'll be 20 to $22. Uh, <clears throat> those feed prices are gonna remain favorable. Um, and so <clears throat> look for, again, those sort of better margins through the, through the next year. Uh, we have had some concern uh, of, of really uh, large cheese and butter stocks. And so of course, when we have a lot of that product available, of course that tends to pull down prices to some extent, but <clears throat> uh, even though those commodity stocks are high, uh, it really hasn't had a huge impact on price. Uh, a couple of times different, uh, a couple of different times during the year, we did see um, the federal government willing to come into the cheese markets and do a couple of buying periods uh, that, that really did push up cheese prices to some extent. And so um, on the export side, we'll just look to see um, sort of those powdered prices uh, climb to some extent as we get a little more competitive there. So let me move into the crop side. So as I've been saying low feed costs, now I'm gonna switch and be on the other side of the coin for that. So, um, <clears throat> so looking at corn, cotton, soybeans, and wheat. So four of the primary um, uh, products here in the row crops here in Georgia, uh, with obviously without peanuts, because we're looking at futures markets here. Uh, you can see corn um, <clears throat> on the year is down to some extent, um, but we're kind of moving into sort of a sideways pattern on corn. Cotton has finally recovered from being uh, really way, way below the cost of production. Um, and I think we're gonna continue to see cotton prices um, <clears throat> sort of uh, uh, move in a sideways pattern and potentially with a little bit of strength. On the soybean side, uh, a decline recently, but then a big jump. Um, and uh, when I get to soybeans, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what's going on on that side of things. On the wheat, we've really just had lots and lots and lots of wheat production, and that has pushed uh, wheat prices very, very low. So looking specifically at Georgia and looking at the, the planted acres, so looking at sort of the total picture would be the height of that bar, um, and then breaking that down uh, into these uh, six different commodities. You can see we had increases in the planted acres uh, from 15 to 16 of our cotton, um, and corn, um, and again, a lot of that's due to sort of strength on the cotton side of things uh, as far as price goes. Peanuts have shrunk to some extent, um, <clears throat> as well as uh, soybeans, wheat, uh, and grain sorghum. Uh, wheat, uh, again, Georgia is a relatively small producer of wheat, um, but in the, western, the farther western parts of the U.S., uh, that big, big increases in production have really uh, squeezed um, our wheat acreage. So looking uh, to, to talk about profitability, we need to look at a little bit about input costs. Um, so as far as seed prices go across the board for all of these six commodities, um, we're looking at sort of minor changes, uh, maybe you know, a 1% increase to some extent, although on the cotton side, that's a little more complicated. Um, 
all fertilizers are down. Again, those fertilizer prices are going to have a lot to do with oil prices. Um, and so <clears throat> fertilizers down, um, nitrogen, uh, <clears throat> phosphorus, and potassium prices are all down. Um, diesel fuel down from a year ago, um, but we believe we've kind of hit a bottom in 2016. Um, and in 17, we'll see uh, somewhat of an increase in those diesel prices. Uh, as far as other chemicals go, uh, some of those are up and some are down, uh, relatively, relatively minor changes. Um, <clears throat> on the fixed cost side of things, uh, machinery just sort of following uh, a typical 1.5% increase, um, and labor rates are about the same. So starting with uh, corn, I'm just going to kind of give you sort of a, a flavor for the supply and demand, and then I'll get right into the, where I think prices are headed. So the red line there is production. The blue is uh, use. Um, so our domestic use of that product, corn in this case, um, and our, also our exports. And so you can see uh, <coughs> record production, um, but also uh, very high um, use as well. And so <coughs> given that we have a, 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 the, the production is higher than our use, um, we're seeing an increase in our ending stocks, which are those bars at the bottom. Um, and our stocks to use ratio, which is that green line. And so if we want to sort of get an idea of where prices are headed, we just sort of look at those ending stocks numbers. And if they're growing, that means downward pressure on price. If those ending stocks numbers are declining, that tends to put upward pressure on prices. Um, so <clears throat> for corn, uh, for the coming year, we're going to look at some weakness on price there. Again, as those stocks have, uh, uh, potentially will increase again. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, and again, that, that, that increase in uh, corn production would be uh, yield driven, not necessarily planted acres driven. So we will see corn acres decrease in 17. And the reason for that is because if we're looking at the I, I states, Iowa, Indiana, and Illinois, where most of our corn and soybean production happens in the US, really the, their decision whether to plant more corn or more soybeans is down to basically just the prices of those two. And so since corn prices have been relatively weak, we'll start to see them plant lower corn, uh, less corn acres and more soybean acres. Um, <clears throat> ethanol levels, uh, you know, ethanol is a huge uh, market for corn. And so uh, again, uh, uh, due to uh, increases in our renewable fuel standards, uh, we'll continue to see uh, demand driven from the ethanol sector. Um, <clears throat> exports are a big question on the corn side um, and really are a big component of all of these products. Uh, but expect to see Georgia prices, uh, we do have a positive basis here in Georgia, so expect to see Georgia prices uh, sort of in the lower quarter of the four range. <clears throat> On the cotton side of things, a lot of this has been down to um, sort of, a, a, of an exports and demand driven side uh, type of thing. Um, we have seen improvements in our cotton exports. Um, mostly due to sort of superior quality. Um, we're expecting uh, exports to increase uh, for, the, for, this, for the current crop. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of that is sort of the, um, um, sort of driven by uh, conditions in China, which I'll get into here in, a, in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> so although our exports have been good, um, that's not uh, sort of an indication of total demand growing. Um, we've had sort of stable demand as far as sort of that overall picture of use of cotton. Um, but you can see um, Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, uh, use of cotton um, kind of uh, moving along that same trend there. Um, so specifically looking at stocks, and so like I said with corn, uh, we always look at ending stocks as kind of an indication of where prices are. And so you can see um, in China, uh, they had built up a very, very large stock of cotton um, over the past several years, and that really contributed to pushing down cotton prices, um, those, those big ending stocks, um, over the last couple years. <clears throat> um, they have been selling off their stocks, you can see there, and I think that's been a big driver of uh, sort of improving our cotton prices. Um, <clears throat> and so we'll continue to see how, um, how fast they sell those ending stocks off and um, just being at a lower ending stocks is gonna help us, I think, in general. So for cotton, for the coming year, we will see uh, US acreage total um, up. Uh, Georgia is number two in, in upland cotton, uh, just behind Texas. 
Um, and so uh, George is gonna be a part of that. Um, <clears throat> that can add some pressure to prices, some downward pressure to prices. Um, but really the thing is, uh, we, we're, we wanna look at uh, sort of our other major competitors on the world stage, uh, India. <clears throat> um, stocks should continue to decline. And so that's, that's a positive story. Um, really, uh, we're gonna see cotton prices. We wanna see those around 70 cents to be at our sort of break even level. And of course we'd like to see them higher than that. Um, but expect prices to be 65 to 75 cents um, and with some pretty strong marketing opportunities uh, towards that 75 cent range uh, throughout the year. For peanuts, uh, so our supply and demand picture um, looks similar in the sense that we have um, higher production or excuse me, uh, it, it's reversed in the sense that we have more domestic use and exports than we did production. Um, and so <clears throat> that has pushed down our, uh, our, our ending stocks to some extent and pushed down our stocks to use ratio, um, which is good news for prices. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, demand in general for peanuts is improving as we've seen, uh, you know, reports that, uh, you know, peanut butter is good for you, it's a healthy product. Um, I have a two-year-old at home, and we've been told that we can give her peanuts a whole lot faster than, um, than, uh, than, than we had been told in the past. So uh, that's certainly a good thing. Um, <clears throat> there have been some reporting issues with peanuts that, that caused a big uh, problem in terms of uh, some of our contracted prices last year. Um, but we're hoping that that, that issue has been uh, dealt with and sort of... <clears throat> continue to uh, see things normalize on the peanut side. So low prices on other commodities combined with uh, program payments um, <clears throat> have kept peanut acres high. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that because of some weakness in program payments on the cotton side, um, we've got a lot of peanut acres out there uh, in terms of just looking at Georgia, um, <clears throat> which can create some production issues uh, as far as plant disease and things like that. Um, our contracts are currently in the 450 to 475 range. Um, producers don't contract 100% of their production, so some of their production is going to be priced lower than that, uh, bringing that average down from that contract range uh, a little bit. <clears throat> On the soybean side of things, <clears throat> again, another uh, sort of record production and record use, uh, and you can see our ending stocks uh, climbing there to some extent which have, has put some pressure, downward pressure on prices um, <clears throat> relatively recently. Um, <clears throat> as far as U.S. soybean acres, we're projected to see an increase in 17. Uh, like I was talking about the I states, uh, we'll, continue, we'll see uh, higher planted acres there and, and most likely higher production uh, based on yield. Um, <clears throat> uh, exports are a big issue on the soybean side, and uh, so we will need to see uh, kind of our competitive situation relative to South America um, and potentially some issues with trade uh, just from, again, some policy uncertainty there. Um, Georgia prices on soybeans uh, <clears throat> between 940 and 962 a bushel. On the wheat side, uh, again, uh, <clears throat> lots and lots of production, you know, strong use, but you can see those ending stocks and stocks to use ratios um, are just really, really, really high. Um, and that really has pushed um, <clears throat> uh, prices down on the wheat side of things. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> we're likely to see planted acres in Georgia decline again um, on the wheat side. Um, <clears throat> we'll continue to see low prices for wheat again based on those ending stocks. Um, large supply just in general across the, uh, across the world um, really is what's, is what's doing this. Um, <clears throat> Georgia prices will between, be between $4 and $4.27. So let's look at some relative profitability um, between sort of our four um, bigger crops. And um, the first one I'm gonna talk about is our dry land or non-irrigated production. Uh, so those relatively high contract prices on peanuts um, are really gonna uh, put them in first place on profitability uh, for those net returns there. So it's sort of a return over our cash cost Cotton's in second place. Again, as I discussed, we kind of have uh, some strength in cotton prices and we're, we're um, uh, pretty confident that we're gonna be, uh, you know, over our cost of production, over our total cost of production and certainly over our cash cost. Uh, soybeans coming in third place, but pretty close to corn there um, as far as 
um, the comparison between those two. On the irrigated side, <coughs> a similar story, um, but you're just sort of pushing the cat, that, that uh, net return number up. Um, and so on peanuts, uh, just shy of $400 an acre as far as net returns go. Um, <coughs> cotton uh, off of that to some extent. And then uh, soybeans and corn, uh, sort of in a similar situation to the non-irrigated side of things. Um, and so with that, I think I'll turn things back over to Kent uh, for our question and answer period. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Levi. That was a lot of information. Well done. <laughs> uh, before we go ahead, we've, we've got a couple other topics I'm just going to talk about here for just a second. Uh, if you look at the timber market, we're looking at the timber market to, to do well this next coming year as well, too. Uh, I heard recently that there's 1,500 people a week moving into Metro Atlanta, right? So they need housing and we're doing construction and we've got all these big construction projects around. So we're looking at demand for, uh, for, for lumber going up in 2017 and also for pulp. We're looking at the demand for pulp to go up. There's been a little bit of a mix in the, the way we use pulp now. It's not so much paper. A lot of it's, you know, going into packaging materials and the paper towels and things like that. So the demand for pulp is looking up in 2016 as well, I mean 17. And then also uh, the demand for pellets, that, that, that demand is still strong. There is going to be some questions out there about what's going on since the uh, EU has pulled out of of Europe, the EU, I'm sorry, Britain has pulled out of the EU. So we're not really sure what that's going to have on the on the pellet market, but we're looking for the pellet market to remain fairly stable in 2017 as well. Uh, just a little bit on honey, uh, the honey markets, the yields were down last year across the state. Uh, there's a lot of pest pressure on the on the colonies. Uh, on the good news, on the good news for that particular market is we're actually seeing an increase in commercial uh, beekeepers, also the the backyard beekeepers, and there's going to be some opportunities for us to send bees out west again to pollinate the, uh, the almond fields out in California. So I was talking to a gentleman yesterday, and with this crazy weather that we have, they're already starting to look for, for bees down in, in the southeastern part of the state to start pollinating uh, the blueberries down there. So the bee market looks like it may be okay next year as well, too. Uh, I guess with that said, does anybody have any questions for any of our, our presenters today? Y'all just want to eat lunch, is that right? That's what everybody's wanting to do? Okay, well, I guess, okay, well, we'll do that. Before we, uh, before we uh, have our invocation, I'd like to acknowledge some folks here today, if, if they wouldn't mind standing up or raising your hand. We've got Representative Chuck Williams here. He's in the back. Uh, we've got George Lee from the Lieutenant Governor's Office over here, all right. Uh, We've got Joshua Finley, Representative, uh, I'm sorry, he's Representative Jody Rice's, or Heiss's representative. He's back here in the back, okay. We've got Andrew Seaver, Senator Purdue's office, over here. All right. We've got Nancy Bobbitt from Isaacson's office, Senator Isaacson, back there, okay. And we also have Paul Brooks from uh, Office of Public Service and Outreach. Jennifer Frum's office, he was here a minute ago. And then also we have uh, Daniela Perry uh, from Senator Isaacson, Isaacson's office as well too, are they, is she here? Oh, right back there, okay, thank you. And uh, with that, I guess we'll go ahead and move on to our, uh, to our invocation, which we don't have listed here, so I guess we won't have an invocation, sorry about that. Uh, all right, with that, I guess we're about ready to eat. If people would like to go out this side door over here and go around and get your food and then come back in and then we'll enjoy some great food and some fellowship. So thank y'all.